The word for 2017 is revival. I said it is revival. If you think that's a good word, I want you to get on your feet and give the Lord the greatest round of applause you've ever given him. Come on, don't we want revival? Isn't that what we desire? Hallelujah. Lord, give us a revival. In 2017, let there be revival in this house, in our families, and in this city. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. I'm choosing a scripture that seems to have a little negative slant as my text, at least at first hearing. Romans 1, 21 through 23. The Bible says this, For although they knew God, underline that in your Bibles, will you? For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, birds and animals and reptiles. This passage from Romans, written in one of the most idolatrous, hedonistic, bloodthirsty, perverse times of human history, sounds very much like our world today, doesn't it? People who refuse to glorify God or give Him thanks, who have welcomed darkness into their hearts and minds and have professed to be wise when in fact they've become fools. Fools that believe God is not the creator, but the chance and time and circumstances. Fools that violently defend a woman's right to choose and yet refuse to give a baby who cannot choose life in the womb. Fools that dishonor marriage with adultery, abuse, and ignorance of God's plan, yet demand to define it as if they are the experts. Fools that have educated their kids in addiction, agnosticism, and humanism, but never once give them the only knowledge that can save their eternal souls. Fools that do the same things, go to the same places, find the same emptiness over and over and over again, somehow expecting things to change, though nothing has changed for them for generations. And with a declining percentage of millenniums, our young leaders claiming to know God, and a declining percentage attending church, and a declining percentage claiming to believe in God, we would seem to be in an unmatched moral and spiritual decline. Romans 1, however, fits us for another reason. Before this description of sin and rebellion unfolds, the writer says, Although they knew God, think of it, although they knew God, my friend, this passage isn't being written to the transgressors of secular society. It is being written to us, to those of us who have known God but have lost our passion for the Word, our zeal for God's house who have lost our love of God's presence and our desire for holy living. CNN recently published an article on young people who are leaving the church in recently record numbers. Now, this paragraph is an indictment I wish every believer could hear. And I quote, put it simply, Older generations of Americans are not passing along the Christian faith as effectively as their forebears. The article goes on to say, young people are less atheist than they are bored. 
picture is very clear, isn't it? We are the people of 2 Timothy 3 and 1. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. There it is. All of the evils of our backslidden, lukewarm hearts can be laid at the feet of our modern, powerless form of Christianity. We've traded the power of God for a benign, let's offend nobody, culturally palatable, socially acceptable model of religious interaction. And the fact is, we're so bored, we no longer have a passion to sell it. And even if we did, our young people are so bored, they aren't buying it. The good news is, there is hope. And in this case, hope has a name. We call it revival. Had a theme song as a young evangelist. Hear the words. God can do it again and again and again. He's the same God today as he always has been. Yesterday, now, forever. He's always the same. There's no reason to doubt God can do it again. You see, we have history. Proof of what God can do. Because he's done it over and over and over again in the past. Some feel this is the darkest hour spiritually that our nation and world has ever known, but that may not be the case. Not many people realize that in the wake of the American Revolution, there was such a moral slump. America could have set its initial course as a godless, secular state. Drunkenness had become epidemic. Out of a population of 5 million citizens, 300,000 were alcoholics. They were burying 15,000 of them every year. For the first time in the history of the American settlement, women were afraid to go out at night for fear of assault. Bank robberies were a daily occurrence. The churches were losing more members than they were gaining. And the younger generation was not at all interested in the church or matters of faith. The Chief Justice of the United States wrote that the church was too far gone to ever be redeemed. Voltaire made his famous statement, Christianity will be forgotten in 30 years. And Thomas Paine became his commentator. A poll taken at Harvard had discovered not one believer in the whole student body. They took a poll at Princeton, thought to be a much more evangelical place, where they discovered that there were only two believers in the student body. Students had a mock communion at Williams College, and they put on blasphemous anti-Christian plays at Dartmouth to raucous approving crowds. They took a Bible out of a local Presbyterian church in New Jersey, and they burned it in a public, much publicized bonfire. Christians were so few on campus in the 1790s that they met in secret like communist cells and kept their minutes in code so nobody would know. While the characters have changed... Through the years, make no mistake about it, the main players have not. We've got to see this in perspective. Don't be distracted by CNN or MSNBC or Fox News. The enemies are still the same. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Satan still comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. We still battle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers of darkness in high places. The devil still goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That is not changed. Still, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. And still, make no mistake about it, Jesus came initially. He was here 
for three and a half years battling the powers of Satan, and his mission is still to destroy the works of the devil. The players have not changed. And don't ever get the feeling that somehow the devil is stronger in this generation or Jesus is weaker. This is about one thing. And one thing alone, it's about us. It's about the church of Jesus Christ waking up and experiencing a heaven sin, a Holy Ghost, devil defeating, sin cleansing, bondage breaking, church shaking, world changing revival. We just need a revival. That's exactly what happened in those pivotal early days in our spiritually depleted nation. In New England, there was a man of prayer by the name of Isaac Bacchus, a Baptist pastor who in 1794, when conditions were at their worst, called for prayer, for revival, to pastors of every Christian denomination in the United States. Churches knew their backs were to the wall. The death rattle was in their throats. So everybody was listening. All the churches dropped their differences And they joined hearts in desperate prayer until America was ablaze with a network of fiery prayer meetings. All the churches agreed to set aside the first first Monday of each month to pray for revival. And it was not long, hallelujah, before real revival came to America. One man journaled that he and his wife had traveled across the entirety of the United States. He said everywhere they'd stopped, he found a powerful revival prayer meeting. And each group thought they were the only ones experiencing revival prayer. Out of that revival, which is called the Second Great Awakening, came the whole modern missionary movement and all of its influence. Out of it came the abolition of slavery popular education, Bible society, Sunday schools, innumerable churches and ministry outreaches. The entirety of the nation began to feel the fires of revival, and it continued growing stronger and stronger in September 1857. There was a man of prayer by the name of Jeremiah Lamphere who started a businessman's prayer meeting in Manhattan. Some of you have heard of it. In response to an advertisement that he put in the paper, only six out of a population of a million in the city showed up. But the following week, there were 14 and then 23. And then it was decided to meet every day for prayer. And in February and March of 1858, every church and public hall in downtown New York, think of it, was filled for a prayer meeting. I don't think you heard me. I said every church and public hall in all of New York City was filled for a prayer meeting. Horace Greeley, a famous editor, sent a reporter with a horse and buggy racing around the prayer meetings to see how many men were praying. He wanted to count. In one hour, he could only get to 12 meetings, but he counted 6,100 men attending those 12 meetings for daily prayer. Then a landslide of prayer began which overflowed to the churches in the evenings. People began to be converted. 10,000 a week were being converted in New York City alone. The movement spread throughout New England, the church bells bringing people to prayer at 8 in the morning, 12 noon, and 6 in the evening. When the revival reached Chicago, there was a young shoe salesman that went to the superintendent of the Plymouth Congregational Church where he attended and asked if he could just teach Sunday school. The superintendent of the Sunday school said, I'm sorry, son, I have 16 teachers, too many, but I'll put you on the waiting list. He said, no, that won't work. He had a revival in his heart. He said, i got to do something right now. And the superintendent said, well, this is what you do. Start a class. He said, how do I start a class? He said, you go get some boys off the street, but don't bring them here. They're too rowdy. Take them out into the country, and after a month, you'll have control of them. Then you can bring them back to church. They'll be your class. He took them to the beach on Lake Michigan, and he taught them Bible verses and Bible games. Then he took them back to Plymouth Congregational Church. The name of that young man was Dwight L. Moody, and that was the beginning of a ministry that lasted 40 years and is still impacting the entire globe. Around the turn of the century, there was a revival that literally shook the world. The results were immediately amazing, and progressively, they have been staggering. In the revival of 1905, I read of a young man who became a famous professor 
Kenneth Scott Lederet. He reported that at Yale in 1905, 25% of the student body were enrolled in prayer meetings and in Bible study. As far as the churches were concerned, the ministers of Atlantic City reported that of the population of 50,000 in Atlantic City, there were only 50 adults that were left unconverted. And in Portland, Oregon, God was moving as well. There were 240 major stores that closed from 11 to 2 each day to enable people every day to attend prayer meetings. They signed an agreement so that nobody would cheat and stay open and do business. The move stateside was precipitated by what revivalists and church historians know as the Welsh Revival. In Wales, a college student named Evan Roberts was so moved by God through an evangelist named Seth Joshua that he returned to his home church and asked his pastor if he would allow him just to speak to the youth of the congregation. Pastor wasn't convinced, but he said, look, I, you can speak at the prayer meeting on Monday. There'll be a few people there. He didn't even let him speak at the prayer meeting. He told the praying people, our young brother Evan uh, has a message for you, and if, if you want to stay after the meeting and hear it, that'll be fine. Seventeen people waited behind, and they were so blown away by the directness of the young man's words. Evan Roberts told his fellow members, I have a message for you from God. Isn't it exciting what revival does to the young? This young man in his early 20s who was so filled with the fire of God that he wasn't going to speak his own message. Oh, no. He had had an encounter with heaven, and he said, I've got a message from God. I pray that by the end of 2017, every one of our teenagers in this place have a message from God. I pray that God will begin to raise up our young men and women to proclaim the gospel as we have never seen. Evan Roberts told his fellow members, he said, I've got this message from God. I want to give it to you. And this is what he said to them. Number one, you must confess any known sin to God and put any wrong done to others right. How many of you in this place are ready to do that? Raise your hand. Second, you must put away any doubtful habit. How many of you are ready to, to put every doubtful habit in the trash this, this year? Thirdly, you must obey the Spirit promptly. How many of you are ready to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit with clarity again? Finally, you must confess your faith in Christ publicly. How many of you are tired of hiding and being embarrassed and worrying about offending somebody and getting in somebody's space? How many of you are ready to be one of those soapbox preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ and share your faith while everyone else is sharing their sin? By 10 o'clock, all 17 people responded. The pastor was so pleased that he asked, how about you speaking at the mission service tomorrow night? And then the, the midweek youth service Wednesday night, Evan preached all week. He didn't even have any sermons. He was just a college kid. Most of the meetings were just him exhorting for just a few minutes and then breaking into worship songs. But the break came. Suddenly the dull ecclesiastical columns of the Welsh papers began to report Great crowds of people drawn to the church. The main road on which that church was situated was packed with people just trying to get in. Shopkeepers closed early to find a place in the church. Now the news was out. A reporter was sent down, and he described vividly what he saw. He's called it a strange meeting, which closed at 425 in the morning. And then people still didn't want to go home. And on Sunday, every church everywhere was filled. The movement went like a tidal wave over Wales. In five months, there were 100,000 people converted throughout the country. A, a, a country that had been noted for taverns and bars and revelry and football. Five years later, a noted theologian wrote a book to try to debunk the revival. His main criticism was that of 100,000 joining the churches in five months of excitement, after five years, only 75,000 still were members of those churches. How many of you will take those statistics any day? Amen? The impact in every sector of society was astounding. For example, in Wales... The judges were presented with white gloves because there was not a case to try. 
There were no robberies. There were no burglaries. There were no rapes. There were no murders. There were no embezzlements. Nothing. Authorities held emergency meetings to discuss what they were going to do with the police now that they were unemployed. In one place, the sergeant of police was sent for, and he was asked, what do you do with your time now? And he said, well, before the revival, we had two main jobs, to prevent crime and to control crowds as at football games. Since the revival started, there's practically no crime, so we just go with the crowds. The counselor asked, what does that mean? The sergeant replied, you know, the crowds, where the crowds are. They're all at church now. He said, well, how does that affect police? He was told, well, we have 17 police in our station, but we have three quartets of those 17. And if any church wants a quartet, they just call the police station. As the revival swept Wales, drunkenness was cut in half. There was a wave of bankruptcies, but it was all taverns going belly up. There was even a slowdown in the mines. For so many Welsh coal miners were converted. They stopped using profanity. And the horses that dragged the coal trucks in the mines couldn't understand what was being said to them. That revival also affected moral standards. The figures given by British government experts said the illegitimate birth rate had dropped 44% within a year at the beginning of the revival. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, we've got to get away from feeling like legislators have the responsibility to do what we as the church alone have the power to see happen. If we want to stem the tide of abortion, we need a revival. The revival swept Britain, Scandinavia, Germany, North America, Australia, Africa, Brazil, Mexico, Chile. And as always, it began through a movement of prayer. One of the most impacting revivals took place in the turn of the century in Los Angeles at a nondescript mission on Azusa Street. I read this description of the meetings during that revival that spawned churches like ours all over the world. Listen to this eyewitness account. It's phenomenal. Many times, waves of glory would come over the tearing room or meeting room, and people would cry out prayers of thanks or praise as they received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Meetings used to go past midnight into the early hours of the morning. Hours there seemed like minutes. Sometimes after a wave of glory, a lot of people would speak in tongues. Then a holy quietness would come over the place, followed by a course of prayer in languages we'd never heard before. Many would fall in the spirit in a trance-like state, buckling to the floor unconscious in a beautiful Holy Spirit cloud. And the Lord gave them visions. How I enjoyed shouting and praising God. During that waiting time, we used to break out in songs about Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Fill me now. Joy unspeakable and love lifted me. Praise about the cleansing and precious blood of Jesus would just spring from our mouths. In between courses, heavenly music would fill the hall and we would break into tears. Suddenly the crowd seemed to forget how to sing in English. Out of their mouths would come new languages and lovely harmony that no human beings have ever heard. Now, I know that some of you feel exactly as I do this morning. How do we get there? How do we access that kind of presence and power? What's the secret? It's never changed. God has always marked the path to revival clearly. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace, and it succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace. Now, what has happened here is that Solomon has created the place for God to move. I want you to look around. Is this an acceptable place for God to move? The Lord appeared to him at night, and he said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, 
or send a plague among my people. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, will humble themselves and pray, say it to the person beside you, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will forgive and I will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open. Hallelujah. Father God, open your eyes. Oh God, toward this place. My ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Will God be attentive to the prayers offered in this place? Will he hear us if we cry out for more? How many of you are tired? of walking through the book of Acts and feeling like you're meeting strangers who have strange powers. Those are not the X-men in the book of Acts. Those are simply ordinary men who have received extraordinary power through being in a revival. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. What worked then will always work, for God never changes. You know, in 1952, Albert Einstein was asked by a Princeton doctoral student, what was left in the world for original dissertation research? This great scientist replied, find out about prayer. Every revival begins with people determining to fervently and, if need be, sacrificially commit themselves to extended times of focused prayer. I remember when Larry Lee's church on the rock in Rockwell, Texas, just exploded with growth. It was such an exciting time. It grew from 13 people in 1980 to 11,000 in 1988. When he was asked about such amazing growth, he said, I didn't start a church, I started a prayer meeting. When David Shibley, who, by the way, has preached here for us, was at that time the minister responsible for prayer in the church, David was asked the secret of the church. He said, the evangelistic program of our church is the daily prayer meeting. Every morning, Monday through Friday, we meet at 5 a.m. to pray. If we see the harvest of conversions falling off for more than a week, we see that as a spiritual red alert and we seek the Lord more fervently. Of course, one of the great stories of revival comes from the nation of South Korea, where the church has grown from almost zero to a projected 50% of the entire population in this century alone. Give the Lord praise for that. Isn't that glorious? (laughs) Pastor Paul Cho One of Seoul's leading pastors attributes his church's conversion rate of 12,000 people a month as primarily due to ceaseless prayer. In Korea, it's normal for church members to go to bed early so they can rise at 4 a.m. to participate in united prayer. It is normal for them to pray all through Friday nights. It is normal to go out to prayer retreats. Cho says that any church might see this sort of phenomenal growth if they are prepared to pray the price and to pray and obey. I remember remember going to Pastor Cho's church on a Wednesday night, and I I was so excited to get there because, as as all pastors, I was enamored with those numbers. But there were only 30,000 people that night for Wednesday night church. But, of course, the concept of small groups was actually developed by this praying pastor. So over 500,000 were engaged in small groups that very week. The takeaway for everybody in our group was the sound of 30,000 people in prayer. It was the first time I understood the sound described by John in Revelation 14 and 2. I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. Pastor Cho repeatedly called that congregation to pray that night. And when they would begin prayer, nobody was looking around, not one person, except me. I was looking. Nobody was distracted. 
Nobody was praying token prayers. Nobody was wanting to stop. Everybody was praying as if life depended on their prayers alone. Everybody was praying out loud. And the roar was like the sound of the ocean roaring. I have longed before Almighty God to hear that one time in this sanctuary where people are able to step out of themselves and so desperately want revival that when we began to pray corporately that you would forget everything around you and from the innermost part of your being and your soul you would begin to cry out to God so that we would have to stop you. The people that night only stopped when Pastor Cho rang a bell to give them the next item of prayer and they would subside. He would give the prayer quest and the roar would begin again. I then visited Prayer Mountain, which is an outreach of Pastor Cho's revival prayer ministry. It's a nondescript area in the countryside that has been set aside by Pastor Cho for 24-7 prayer. There's an auditorium that seats 15,000, and then there are these hundreds of prayer grottos that are just small concrete and wood structures built into the side of the mountain. As I crawled into one of those prayer grottos, I could feel the powerful presence of God, and I knew it was the multiplied thousands of accumulated prayers that had been prayed in that place. I've been a part of several sovereign moves of God, and it's always the same. It always begins with people determining that they are going to pray. I remember when I was 17 years old and preaching in Pensacola, Florida with our singing group, The Vessels. Dan remembers this very well. We've talked about it hundreds of times. This church needed a revival. They were the frozen chosen, believe me. As kids, we understood even then, that every move of God's Spirit comes through fervent and frequent prayer. So we prayed for two hours daily during our crusades, and as we traveled, it was our rule that one of us would be on our knees at all times praying for the visitation of the Spirit of God at our next destination. We had an older van, and there was no carpet on the floor, so we knew that we'd prayed enough when our knees burned so badly on that that metal floor till it was time to get up. God never failed to bring a revival awakening. Listen to this. Everywhere we went, and we were just teenagers. The first night in Pensacola was so dead and dreadful, we decided to pray into the wee hours of the morning for revival, and we did. Sure enough, the next night, heaven visited the earth in Pensacola. As I was standing at the altar area that was filled with people repenting and crying out to God. Not one person sitting in the pews. Everyone on their face before God. No one wanted to go home. The meeting went past midnight. As I was standing there in the altar, a precious lady took hold of my shoes. And I looked down and said, who is holding on to my shoes? She spoke to me in broken English. She was Hispanic, but I'll never forget what she said. She said, every week I clean this church for six years. For six years, every week, I pray for God to send a revival. While I pray, God give me a vision. And I see you walk back and forth and back and forth. And hallelujah, God has answered my prayer. I remember when revival hit Louisiana Tech University in the early 70s. We started out establishing a Chi Alpha meeting, which actually consisted of two members, myself and the wife of a guy who always had to work when our meetings were being conducted. This quiet, frail, little wisp of a thing. I was the president of Chi Alpha. She was the vice president. I was the secretary. She was the treasurer. We had to have more jobs than one 
because it was just the two of us. But we began to do the only thing we knew to do, and that was to meet together, the two of us, and pray. And we didn't just pray, oh, God, grow our group. We prayed, I prayed for a campus-wide shaking revival. And God began to send young people who had that same fire in their belly to see a move of the Spirit. I will never forget the second year. I stood before the little group, and I said, this is what we're going to do. I said, number one, we're going to pray, and number two, we're going to preach. And I said, we're going to do it right out there in the middle of that quadrangle. So we went into the middle of the quadrangle at Louisiana Tech at 5 o'clock in the morning, and we would get on our faces before God. And if you were to walk through that dark center of the campus at Louisiana Tech at 5 o'clock, you would have thought they were having some kind of seance because there were kids that were kneeling all over that campus. They had blankets over their heads because sometimes it was cold on those mornings in the winter. But we weren't missing. We were showing up to seek God, and we were crying out, oh God, shake this campus for your glory. That little group of two turned into a group of 15, and then it was 25, and then it was 50, and then we were the largest Christian group meeting on campus every Tuesday night. We never met that we didn't see somebody saved or baptized in the Holy Ghost. We rented the school swimming pool, had a huge baptismal in the pool. I met a businessman who came to Songs of the Season. He walked right up, and this lawyer in our town said, ha, ha, I was there when you were there at Louisiana Tech. I thought he was going to talk about me quarterback. And he said, you used to baptize people right there in the Olympic swimming pool. Let me tell you, God began to work and to move in such an incredible manner that you could literally feel the tangible presence of God as you walk through the campus. People begin to get saved. They begin to repent. They had no desire to even turn their face toward God. God. It was a revival. And when revival comes, everything changes. I remember the Bellingham, Washington revival. I went to a little community of Bellingham, Washington, 50,000 people. I was going to stay there for three days. I stayed for nine weeks. For nine weeks, we had church every night, and nobody could explain what was happening because you could get there an hour early, and people were running into the building. They were running into the building to get a seat. 30 minutes before the meeting started, the place would be jam-packed. We had to take the back wall out of the sanctuary and put chairs all the way to the street. People were hungry for God, and the crazy thing was these weren't church people. This revival had spread through the street streets of, of Bellingham in such a proportion that God had given us a tsunami of conviction. People were coming that had never served God, that had never been church. Yes, some were coming back to their faith, but many were accepting him for the very first time. I will never forget standing before the people and realizing that as a young evangelist, I'd run out of messages. I had about 25 good ones, really good ones, but I ran out of my messages. And so I just stood before the people honestly and I said, let me just tell you something. I don't have any more messages to preach. So I'm to, going to every night just turn to the book of John and I'll begin to read and, and I'll preach there as the Spirit gives me an anointing. You see, I couldn't study during the day because when revival hits, everybody's busy. You, you have to run from this school to that school and from this meeting to that meeting and from this prayer meeting to that prayer meeting. And that was what was happening to me. I was busy all day long and then I would run and get dressed and I would go to the house of God and when I walked in, I was amazed there they were packed to the ceiling just ready for the word of God we had a terrible piano player we didn't have one musician in that entire church that could follow me if I sang oh how I love Jesus I played an old 12 string guitar and I could barely play it but I played it I'd sing a couple of songs and then I'd put it aside I would read the word of God and then after I read the word of God and commented for a few minutes I'd close the Bible I'd say well I know why you've come you've come to give your lives to Jesus so just come on down and there would be 50 to 100 people that would step out and they would begin to come there was no coaxing there was no pleading there was no emotion they were coming to give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ over 2,000 cards were in our hands after nine weeks of revival meeting and to this very day I can go back to Bellingham I can walk the streets and people will point to me and say Denny, Denny is that your name? I say yes the revival the revival I I got saved in the revival. The 
the word is revival. And this morning is about what's going to happen a week from now. Because this is the most important moment so far in our quest for revival. In just a few days, January 8th, that's next Monday, right? Next Sunday, next Sunday. We will begin a 21-day quest of fasting and prayer for revival. For 21 days, we will meet here at 6 o'clock in the morning, and we will cry out to God to give us a city-shaking, life-changing revival. For 21 days, we will fast. You say, what does that mean? Well, you will get a manual next Sunday, and it's going to be your guide through this 21 days. And there will be descriptions. There are various fasts that you can do. Here's what I've discovered. Please hear me. Anything you do to discipline yourself with your diet becomes a fast and will impact every other area of your life. What we are saying is no to the flesh and yes to the Spirit. We are going to fast for 21 days. And for 21 days at 6 o'clock in the morning, we will be here crying out to God for revival. Well, will God do it, Pastor? Will he do it? I don't know. I don't know. Because there is a sovereign element to revival that you, you cannot... predict all I know is this if we come at 6 o'clock in the morning and we pray and we fast for 21 days God will know about it he will see us And if we pray, he might send a revival. But if we do not pray, there's not a chance. This whole year, we're going to be talking about revival. We're going to be talking about the R for repentance. The E for exceedingly, abundantly above. Come on, somebody. We're going to be talking about the V, that's victory over addictions, past habits, and scars of yesterday. We're going to be talking about the I, that's for intimacy. How many of you are ready to really get in his presence? We're going to be talking about the V for vision. The A for being all in because we want all he has. We're going to be talking about the ill. You know what that's for? Lordship. Don't want to just know you, Jesus. I want you to rule and reign over every area of my life. There is only one place you can participate in a real revival. And that's on your knees in the place of prayer. Psalm 85 says, You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Oh, restore us again, God our Savior. Put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? 
Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Will we be talking years from now about the revival of 2017? How we got up early so hungry for God? How we fasted through the cries of our appetites? How we saw cancer vanquished from our midst. Not one tumor in the entire church. How we saw heart disease disappearing supernaturally. How we saw clinical depression destroyed. How we saw our prodigals come home. How we saw marriages mended and financial miracles. So many. How we saw a mighty harvest gathered and prophecies released. Thousands repenting worship right out of heaven enemies reconciled missionaries commissioned revival 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 see how Dak does against Philadelphia. I'm not preaching against that. I'm going to watch him too. But it will, it, it, will, it, will, it will largely have not impacted you. Here's the second reaction. The second reaction is I don't know what he's talking about but if I love pastor and if that's what he wants I hope he gets it. And then here's the third. I'm not sure I know everything that a revival is, but I've heard enough about it today to know I want one personally, and I want to be involved in one corporately in my lifetime. Now, if you're all in, if you're all in, and you want that, you, you want revival, you, you want to see God do something like that in your lifetime. Then all I want you to do is to get up out of your seat and come to the front of this place if that's what you desire. If that's what you desire, come. Come right now in the name of Jesus. Come if that's your desire. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. If you're a visitor here, you can stay right at your seat. You be blessed. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you for being here. Everyone else, yes, you're moving forward. Yes, 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 yes. I want a revival. I'm tired of the form. I'm tired of the ritual. I'm tired of going through the motions. I'm, 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 I'm tired of that which we can expect and, and that which we can define and, and that which we can predict. I'm, I'm ready for God to move. I'm ready to see him do something extraordinary. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus.
holy ground. God would do it here. We're not going to lock him into anything he's done before. We want him to use all of his imagination, his creativity to, to blow upon us and to send a revival that will be exactly what he wants. Oh, I can't wait to see what he does here. Lift your hands all over this place. Lift your hands and right now cry out to him. Can, can you lift your voices? Would you lift your voices audibly to God? Can we have that roar of the waters of God's people crying out right now for a real revival? Lord, we want a real revival. Lord, we cry out. Here's what I want you to do. How many of you in this place, or how many of you in this place ever get to a spot where you just go into the presence of Jesus and you say, Jesus, I'm just so tired of every time I come into your presence making it about me. Have, have any of you ever gotten there? Honestly, lift your hands. I'm just tired of always making it about me. The only times I'm fervent is when, you know, I'm on the hot seat or something's wrong. Here's what we want to do in this cry for revival. We want revival to be what he wants. Amen. It's not what we want. It's what he wants. How many of you are ready to give yourself to something that he wants, that he desires? And so right now, would you just lift your hands and your hearts again? Because let me tell you something. We're just getting started. We're about to do the work of prayer. We're about to do the work of prayer. It's going to be one of the most enjoyable things that has ever happened in your life. And let me just say this to you. You can get in on any level because you don't have to go to the PhD level of prayer right off. You can come in at a level where you're just reading prayers. Let me tell you something. All those prayers in Psalms are powerful. There was never a greater time of anointing than when I read from the Psalms at the end of this message. Because you see, wherever you are, you can get involved in a revival. Because it's not about you. It's about Him. Amen? It's about what He wants for you. How many of you know He wants the best for you? Amen? I want you right now to lift your hands and I want you to say, God, I want it to be good for you. Jesus, 
I want this to be good for you. Just tell him. Say, Lord, send something that you want. Lord, do something in us that you've always wanted to see. Lord, something that we've perverted so many times. Even when you begin to move, we almost immediately grab it and make it something else. We almost again to detour it toward our own wishes and desires. We, we want people to know about what's happening in us and, and with us. But God, we want to tell you, we don't want this to be a self-centered thing. We want this to be a God-centered thing. And we want Jesus, you to get glory out of what you do in this house. Come on, just praise him. Oh, we give you glory, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. I remember in the Jesus movement in the early 60s that one of the revival courses that actually was a portal to the present day worship movement was hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say it. Hallelujah. Just lose yourself in Him for a moment. Hallelujah. Shut yourself away with Him. Hallelujah. 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 preach a stirring sermon this week because I too am on this journey I find myself listening to hours and hours of men of God right now I'm just so hungry for God and he preached on the fullness of Christ he said how many of you want the fullness of Christ let me ask that question how many of us want the fullness of Christ and he said, the reason that men and women don't find the fullness of Christ is because they want to relate only to the head in heaven. He said, they don't want to relate to the fullness of the body on the earth. And he said, there's a glory in the Lord's church. Hallelujah. Right now, this is the first step. Can somebody say amen? I said, this is the first step. And let, me, let me say this to you, folks. You can do everything else spot on. But if we do not make this a prayer movement, it will not yield real revival. Hallelujah. All around you is the fullness of Christ. Because as in Abraham, God revealed himself as a personal God, a personal Savior. When Jesus came, he said that he had come to redeem a bride. And the bride is not personal. The bride is corporate. So all around you is the fullness of Christ. All around you is what makes him happy. All around you is what brings joy to his heart. Right now, we're going to get in touch with the head all week long. I'm going to tell you, I want you to prepare. How many of you say, I'm going to get spiritually ready for, for the eighth? You'll say, come on, how many of you are going to get spiritually ready? Say, I'm, say, come on, lift your hand if you say, I'm going to get spiritually ready for the eighth. Get spiritually ready for the eighth. You better get spiritually ready because God's about to do something extraordinary. We're asking for it. I said we're asking for it. Amen. I, I said all year, what we're asking for is revival. Amen. That's what we're asking for. Hallelujah. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Bless the name of the Lord. All right, listen. I want us, as the last thing we do before we walk out of here this morning, I want us to get just a couple of three people around us, and I want you to join hands. 
And I, want, I don't want you to lead in prayer where one prays and two listen. I want us to do it the roar way. I want you to go ahead and pray right out loud. And you don't have to pray loudly. I said you didn't have to pray loudly. You just pray. And if you pray silently, that's good. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to join hands with a couple of people. And I want you to say, with me, please, if you'll do this. With me, I want you to say this. Lord Jesus, we employ the power of agreement on this very first Sunday of this year to cry out for revival. Hallelujah. 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 Now, I want you to begin to pray right now, agreeing with that person. Agree with them for revival. Agree with them for revival. We've got work to do. I said we've got work to do. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, agree with them. Agree with them for revival. Hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus. you to give me your attention folks let me say this to you we're on a journey we're on a journey but how many of you understand when he walks in and he releases heaven on earth to us we will know when it's right amen i said we will know when it's right i believe that one of the greatest disturbances that we have is that we try to handcuff god and say it's not you until it looks like this until it feels like this let me tell you something I believe God is going to do something here that is going to so delight us. 
I've been in three revivals in my lifetime and not one of them was similar except Jesus was there every time. And what I can tell you is that he is going to do something here this year. And it, it's not just going to be, we're not just going to talk about revival and just be satisfied with, with just the measure that we've already always had. That's not what we're going to do. We're not, we're not hoodwinking the people or trying to find some kind of little slogan. We're going to see God move. I said, we're going to see God move. We're going to see God move. And praise God. Can somebody just shout in this house? One, two. Amen. One more time. Amen. We thank God for what he's doing other places. But I said, we want to see God move. Say it with me. Hallelujah. It's going to happen. It's going to happen in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love that. Wow. That was so precious. So precious. Hallelujah. I'm going to bless you. And look, listen to me. We're starting on a journey. What I've discovered is this. You can only build a building as strong and as high as the foundation you establish. We're in no hurry. We just want to see God move. And so we're going to do what he asks. I said we're not going to take the shortcut. Did you hear me? I said we're not going to take the... Come on, somebody. We're not going to take the shortcut. What we're going to do is show up at 6 o'clock and we're going to pray. And we're going to fast. And heaven is going to kiss the earth. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Just tell him one more time. Say, we want you and only you, Lord. We want you, Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Mm-hmm. Praise God. Praise God. The only blessing that I leave you with today is this. I leave you with the blessing of revival. Give the Lord praise. Give him 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 praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I leave you with the blessing of revival. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Bless the name of the Lord. Thank you for joining us. We hope this message has equipped and encouraged you. For current events and other resources, visit ccpeople.com. And remember, the best is yet to come.